I am going to get started. Okay. That's fine. And we can ad I'll admit people after that. So That's welcome fine. everyone to the ICB Aviation Skillnet webinar on future thinking and adoptability of the aviation sector. Today, our presenters are Simon Hagg and Dermot Mannion. Simon is the CEO of GCM Consulting Limited, which serves Ireland, the UK and Australia and operates at simonhaig.com. Simon helps organizations and leaders to unlock, build and sustain business, leadership, brand and mindset growth through his coaching, consulting, training, publications, speaking and e-learning programs. Simon's clients include high performing leaders, companies, business schools such as Trinity College, Smurfit UCD, Southampton UK, professional organizations and government bodies globally. His work is endorsed by the number one leadership leader, Marshall Goldsmith, and features in Leader Home Top 100 Thought Leader Series for Mindful Negotiation. Simon has also been featured on the BBC, Australia's ABC television, and numerous radio and podcast channels. Simon has his own radio show on UK's first wellbeing channel, Serenity Radio. Simon started out as a commercial and aviation lawyer who, also as an entrepreneur, has built and sold out of technology, luxury items, and travel companies. He has also been a C-suite executive, set on five boards across different industries, four continents for 27 years. Simon is an associate member of Marshall Goldsmith Stakeholder Centered Coaching Organization. And Simon's book publications include How to Be a Better Deal Closer and Deal Making for Corporate Growth. Simon is an acclaimed keynote speaker on world, on world forums. Most recently, this includes Brand Forum London 2019, Startup Scale Up Summit UK 2020, and Bagu Investment Summit China 2021. And now to Dermot. Dermot Mannion is well known in the airline industry with over 30 years experience operating across three continents. Initially, Dermot had a distinguished career at Emirates in Dubai, rising to the position of president of Group Support Services. Between 2005 to 2009, he held the position of Aer Lingus CEO, completing the privatization of the airline. More recently, as deputy chairman of Royal Brunei Airlines, Dermot played a key role in the award-winning rebranding and restructuring program. Dermot is now a consultant based in Ireland with an involvement at advisory and board level in worldwide aviation projects. He recently completed a team, a term as a board member on one of the largest IT companies based in Singapore. Dermot is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ireland and a graduate of Trinity College Business School, Dublin. He holds a diploma in executive coaching from the Irish Management Institute and is active in mentoring young entrepreneurs. Over the course of 40 minutes, Simon and Dermot will provide an update on where the aviation sector is at and will outline the aviation skills required to operate in an aviation VUCA world. Simon and Dermot will outline the corporate skills needed and the mindset required for the new normal. The ground rules for today. Simon and Dermot will present for about 40 minutes. And invite, and invite and both of them invite you to unmute and explore topics with them as they arise during the presentation. We encourage you to submit questions, comments via the chat function also, or raise your hand. We will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation also. Where we encounter problems with broadband, please bear with us in case we need to pause the camera. Today's session is being recorded. And without further delay, I will pass you over to Simon and Dermot and we will get started. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cloda, and thanks for those. I thought you were going to go with the long form bios, but uh, anyway, and at least everybody knows us. And uh, <laughs> welcome, and uh, I see Alan has joined, which is great. Welcome, everybody. So right. let's head straight into it. So we're going to be talking today about future thinking and adaptability in the aviation sector. And as you can see, Dermot and I have already done a fair amount of work with probably a handful of, of aviation finance and engine finance companies around deal making, cultural cohesion communications and remote team management, which is very poignant given that we're going to be covering some of this stuff as we go through. And um, we, we, Dermot will be sharing industry specific numbers, and then we'll both be sharing some generic um, information and some tips and some advice around, you know, the whole area of resilience and adapt adaptability as we move forward. So, and obviously the, the more, the more questions and chat, the better. And I don't need to go through my bio again. I'm not going to go through that. Dermot, are you happy for us to go through yours? 
Uh, skip no, over your... we're, 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 we're good to go. The, the only thing I didn't admit in that bio is that I was a banker once, but I suspect if the audience knew that they were in the hands of a reformed lawyer and a reformed banker, we wouldn't get too far. So I kept that out. The numbers would go down. Okay. <laughs> so so are, we start with the premise, are we going back and, and how adaptable are we? Okay, so th this is a nice little image of, of the aviation sector just before um, I think this was taken around February time. It was about February time. So um, are we going back or are we never going to go back the way we were before? That's kind of the premise. And Cloda mentioned that, um, you know, we are in a, a, a very much a VUCA world. My question, I guess, first question to you, Dermot, is how resilient would you say objectively the aviation industry has been this year? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Simon and colleagues, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Claudia, for the introduction. Uh, this uh, VUCA acronym, uh, it comes from the coaching world where they talk about dealing with the uncertainty of life and the uncertainty of the working life, where things can be volatile, unpredictable, complex and ambiguous. And boy, have we seen all of that in, in, in the last 12 months. I, I think as we go through the presentation today, you'll see a number of instances where you know, the industry is, is responding in quite a remarkable way to some of the challenges that we've seen. And, and even in the last 48 hours, we talk of uh, vaccines on the increase now. And um, there's been some further grounds for optimism coming through. A number of airlines like Singapore Airlines expanding their long haul network. They're going to start flying to Johannesburg next week. Uh, Sri Lankan Airlines had their first flight to Melbourne, Australia uh, for over 12 months. Uh, the other day. Goal in, in Brazil will become the first airline uh, to recommence commercial operations with the, uh, with the MAX jet. Uh, and American Airlines just overnight are now offering home test kits to passengers as a further encouragement and a further inducement for people to go back traveling. So, you know, uh, the airline industry has always been incredibly dynamic. It has had to be incredibly dynamic because everything that happens in the world has an almost immediate impact on the airline industry. So in that sense, I suppose, we've been as well prepared as one could be for the challenges that COVID has uh, brought us. Thanks, Simon. Okay, and uh, so th that's the positive news. If you have a look at this chart here, um, Brand Finance is the world's largest brand valuation agency, and they look at various industry sectors and no surprise, you can see that the aviation sector, along with tourism and leisure and airports and hotels, have been obviously the hardest hit from a, from a brand value perspective. So no surprise there. But let's try and focus on, let's get a little bit deeper now into the specifics of the industry. Um, before we do that, you, you know, this crisis is different to previous crises. This is probably one of the first ever crises that hasn't been caused by a financial bubble economic monetary policy mistakes or oil. This has been caused by a health-induced supply and demand side failure. And um, But the same as every crisis, leadership resilience will be best displayed by those leaders, and we're all leaders here, who demonstrate effective communications and strong but compassionate decision-making and, um, you know, compassionate, calm and courageous. And Dermot, I mean, would you say the aviation industry has fared no worse than any other industry from a leadership decision-making perspective this year? Well, I, I think, uh, if anything, I suspect uh, the airline industry has done rather better than, than, than other sectors. I mean, when you see the scale of the crisis that's reflected in the next couple of slides, it's remarkable that the industry has been able to survive to any degree at all in, in that period of time. So. I think the, uh, the portents are encouraging, uh, and although there is still some way to go in the crisis, I think the level of resilience which has been shown is very encouraging. Absolutely. Okay, so over to you on a number of, sli a number of factual slides. Yeah, um, the, first of all, thank you to Sirium uh, Consulting for uh, sharing some material about the global trends here. Um, I mean, much of this is pretty well known already to this audience, but, you know, sometimes it bears repeating, I think, exactly the extent of the crisis that we've been through between April and August, up to 80% of global capacity simply removed, not operating, a, a very marginal recovery uh, through to September, where uh, we were still 59% below 
previous capacity levels and a further marginal in increase again uh, in October where we're now at 57 percent and I suspect November we haven't seen the data for November yet but it will bounce along as uh, something similar now all of this of course is uh, pre and news of the vaccine and as I suggested a few minutes ago I think even the news of the vaccine is going to have uh, an upward effect and we're going to see uh, some positive impact of that uh, in the next days and, and weeks. We'll move to the next one, if I may. Yep. In terms of what we call domestic uh, schedules uh, worldwide here, um, most of the markets that we know best, uh, intra-Europe, for, for instance, which is colored yellow here, you can see it bouncing along at levels of 60 to 80 percent below previous levels. But just look at China, which obviously was the first country to be impacted uh, by the virus. Uh, the recovery there is now to a point where domestic travel uh, in these most recent weeks, that black line at the top, is actually moving ahead of where it was <laughs> in 2019, which is a pretty remarkable achievement in and of itself and is an indicator, I think, that the recovery uh, could be uh, quite sharp when it comes in the other marketplaces. And we'll move to the next one. Yep. Long haul, of course, has been a very, very difficult story. You can see everything pretty much falling off a cliff there uh, in the late March, early April period to levels between uh, 80 and even 100% uh, below where they were uh, in previous years. But again, uh, these stats only go to the 25th of November. I think as we begin to see the December data, the January data, and into early next year, with some of the news that I just mentioned in terms of airlines ramping up their long haul activity, and I know my old former colleagues at Emirates have been very aggressive too in putting their long haul aircraft back to work. There are some favorable signs there that we might begin to see at the early stages of a long haul uh, recovery. And we'll move to the next one, Simon. Yep. In terms of uh, aircraft uh, storage, um, Again, and, and this, I suppose, points to the resilience of the industry. At the worst of the crisis, there was in excess of 60% of the world's fleet parked, stored, short term, medium term or whatever at, at various stages. And that figure is now down to about 30%, which is a pretty remarkable achievement in itself in what has been a, a very difficult market situation, to put it mildly. So the industry already there, I think you can see, is showing the signs of adaptability that uh, we so desperately need in this particular uh, crisis. And we'll move to the next slide, Simon, thank you. Yeah. This is another representation of aircraft storage, which again, just emphasizes the fact that from that peak back in April time, uh, the numbers are now reduced uh, the concern that Sirium raised, and these uh, slides are over one month old now, is that the rate of um, decline in this particular uh, chart, or the rate of return uh, of aircraft to active service, has kind of petered out a little bit, and that there is some concern that the six and a half thousand units that are stored at the moment, that that number could bounce along uh, for perhaps longer than the industry had feared. But again, the caveat there is this is all pre-vaccine uh, and we'll have to see how far the vaccine will take us along that road. My own view is that as we get into uh, next year, especially on short haul uh, aircraft or single aisle as they're referred to in this chart, we will begin to see a recovery and a return of aircraft to active service. So state of the nation, Dermot. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, some uh, recent projections here uh, that uh, are worth sharing. Uh, Euro control in its most recent forecast uh, dated this year, 2020, their view is that we won't recover to 2019 levels until 2024. And that view, I would say, up until recently, re certainly recent weeks, has been quite widely shared across the industry. What impact the acceleration and the vaccination process will have on that, uh, we'll have to see. But I think if anything, uh, this um, uh, projection may turn out to be uh, pessimistic. 
At the height of the crisis, as we've seen in the previous chart, 64% of the global fleet was inactive. This, according to the latest Sirium data, down to 30%. But again, as I mentioned, that rate of recovery is itself something of a concern. And we'll have to see where that goes in the next weeks and the early months of the new year. Oliver Wyman, in their projections for uh, 2020, they talked about a pretty stark statistic here that the current number of 900 plus carriers today could be 600 within three years. It'd be interesting to hear what other participants on today's uh, discussion have about that. My own view is that that's probably uh, uh, on the pessimistic side now, uh, because what we've seen at an individual airline level is quite a remarkable degree of resilience in, in recent weeks. The retirement of aircraft is also going to be another big issue going forward, and it's certainly something of considerable interest to the aircraft leasing community in, in particular. In recent years, the average annual retirement would have been about 650 units a year. That number for sure will rise to about 2,500 or maybe more in this current year of, of 2020. And the feeling thereafter is that um, in the years to come, we may well be looking at a benchmark of 1,000 plus units retiring uh, year on year. And I suppose the final manifestation of that, which the Oliver Wyman people put forward, is that in our industry, uh, even in recent years, practitioners would have talked about operating aircraft for up to perhaps a maximum of 25 years before scrappage. I think that time horizon is going to advance uh, to 20 years and maybe even shorter than that as the next number of years uh, unfold. And we move to the next slide, please, Simon. Again, some further views uh, from Oliver Wyman. I know the MRO sector is represented on uh, today's webinar. You may well have, have, have views about this, but their view was that the cannibalization of aircraft could result in a cut in MRO activity by as much as 50% this year. And uh, I guess we'll have to see where that figure might go uh, in the years to come. They also made a prediction. They say that for the future, aerospace manufacturers may need to participate more directly in leasing services. Mm. I'm not sure about that. I mean, Boeing and Airbus in the past have pretty extensively got involved in aircraft financing, aircraft leasing. I'm not sure that it's worked all that well, if I'm honest. I think the aircraft leasing community, much of it, of course, based here in Ireland, does a much better and a more efficient job of that. So I'm not sure that the answer is going to be bringing the OEMs back into that financing and leasing space. But again, other participants may have a view on that. Oliver Wyman's uh, closing position is that, uh, yes, we will see a couple of difficult years, but the industry will get back onto track in terms of growing the fleet worldwide to 35,000 units by 2020. And 35,000 units has, if you go back 12 months, for instance, that is the level of um, fleet activity that Airbus and Boeing would have been projecting. Oliver Wyman are, uh, Oliver Wyman are now saying, after a, 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 perhaps a short time delay over the next year or two, those, that growth will reemerge and we should get back to that sort of fleet level. And we'll move to the next one. Corporate travel. Yeah, one of the participants uh, asked a specific question about this, and of course they've hit the nail on the head. This is a big deal. Uh, Davy Stockbrokers, in their most recent review as of two weeks ago, highlighted a concern about a delayed recovery <coughs> in corporate travel. Uh, Chris Terry, who is an analyst based in the UK that I've known and worked with for many years, Chris, in his latest projection, and this is only 48 hours old now, so it's pretty much hot off the press. Chris is saying that business travel may well only reach 30% of previous levels over the first 12 months of the recovery period. Yeah. 
Again, I'd be interested to hear what other participants on the call have to say about that. My own view is that at a certain point, we will all leave the Zoom world behind us and we'll go back to doing some level of business activity akin to what we've done before. So there will be a recovery uh, on long haul uh, business travel. But I think the point is well made that it could be 2022 before we really begin to see that recovery uh, kick in. Now, these are some further thoughts here from uh, Chris Terry in that latest art article. And if you just, yeah, uh, I would refer you to uh, Business Travel News Online uh, two days ago. This is Chris's latest view. Overall, he says a demand will recover, albeit at different rates in the different sectors of the market, and then begin to grow beyond previous levels. And that kind of reflects the Oliver Wyman view, which is that it may take us a little time, but we will get back on track and we will begin to see a growth path emerge again. Um, Chris also puts forward the view that uh, we will begin to see the beginnings of a recovery by the start of the IATA summer season uh, 2021, which is in late March of next year. He refers to the fact that the VFR, which is visiting friends and relative and leisure traffic, will recover uh, most quick quickly. And I would agree with that, especially across the short haul uh, route networks. He also makes the point that the region with the fastest rate of recovery will be Asia. And indeed, I think we're seeing that already. You saw that a few minutes ago on the China uh, chart. Now, just in the corner of my screen, I saw a comment uh, from someone, but I couldn't read it uh, properly. Yeah, it's from Kieran. Is it a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, uh, Kieran, would you like to unmute Kieran and just add, propose your comment? Sure thing. Good morning. Uh, thanks again, Simon and Dermot, for the presentation. Yeah, it was just on the uh, prediction by Oliver Wyman that they expected OEMs to increase their presence in the financing market. I on the recent news that Castle Lake, the American lessor, are stepping in to provide five billion of funding to selectively support and underpin deals at, that would be drawn in by Boeing Capital. It would actually suggest the contrary is likely to be true. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, Simon. Yeah, and look, that would be my experience as well, because, you know, in the end, um, the financing is all coming from the same sources. I mean, the, the, whether it's uh, the leasing division of Boeing or Airbus or the aircraft leasing community, they are all in turn going to aircraft financiers in the banking sector for financing. And my sense is that the leasing community do that in a much more efficient uh, fashion than the OEMs have ever been able to do. And thank you for sharing that, uh, Kieran. It absolutely confirms that 100%. And of course, uh, while all of that is going on, uh, the clamor continues, and rightly so, for further improvements in the area of aircraft decarbonization. And I would refer you uh, to the Clean Sky EU report, which is dated in May of this year. This, as you know, is a joint venture between the EU and some of the major participants, airlines and OEMs, uh, across Europe and indeed across uh, the world uh, in the effort to produce uh, a situation where we can take more and more carbon out of the industry. The report is very interesting, but it's also very honest and open in pointing out the significant challenges that lie ahead. They make the point that an inspiring midterm target might be the introduction of a hydrogen powered short haul aircraft on or around 2035. And that came with a health warning, though, that in terms of cost, it won't be cheap. And the cost per packs of such an initiative is very likely to be at least 15% higher than the cost per pack, which is currently provided by the existing fleet. That is going to be challenging in a very price sensitive, short haul, single aisle marketplace. For long range uh, aircraft, hydrogen power uh, is less suitable from an economic perspective, according to the report. And there, 
the higher cost per passenger is incredibly challenging, currently estimated at the moment to be between 40 and 50% higher than what is, is currently costing. And again, this is going to be challenging. When we all live in a price sensitive marketplace, that is, is set to continue. And it's highly questionable as to whether the traveling public would be willing to pay 40 or 50% more to operate in a carbon free environment. That will have to be tested. And there's some significant further work to be done. And again, I'd be interested to get any comments from the floor uh, on that particular area as well. We'll move to the next one, Simon, thank you. In the meantime, one uh, immediate positive outcome of the COVID pandemic is the acceleration in the retirement of older aircraft that I referred to a few minutes ago. By definition, that will result in lower emissions across the industry and that in and of itself is a good thing. And it's also one of those examples of where even in a crisis, by taking a pragmatic approach, you can end up with a good story emerging from something which started off as a much less encouraging a story. Very much. Can I just yeah, on that Yes, last, please. Dora. Just on that last slide, is there any investment stimulus? So to go back to Kieran's piece a little bit, any investment stimulus to prompt the hydrogen or the lower emission for the industry? So is that is that coming from the policy or? Uh, I, I think part of the Green Sky initiative is to do two things. First of all, figure out what the solution looks like and then uh, figure out what kind of support regime will be required uh, in order to deliver it. And I think it's fair to say that um, there will be significant support available at the level of the EU and indeed uh, across the world, uh, because everybody has got the same ambition. It's a bit like the worldwide initiative that's been going on in recent months to find a vaccine to COVID. Everyone has an equal interest in this whole decarbonization process. Uh, there is whichever region of the world leads the way on this will end up with a significant uh, technical advantage over the rest. So my sense is that government support will not be the limiting factor. Right now, they're just struggling to make the technology work in the way that the industry can live with. Thanks, George. Thank you. Just a few comments then about, uh, I suppose, how we've all lived and worked our way through this COVID response uh, period. Uh, this first note here is, is a quote from a, a book that I would encourage uh, any participant in today's uh, discussion to, to read by Mike Newman on this whole issue of emotional capitalists, the new leaders and the essential strategies for building your own leadership success and emotional intelligence. He says something very relevant about when you react to something, you're not making a conscious choice, but acting out of habit. The problem with acting out of habit is that it tends to result in a knee jerk reaction, which is very much a repeat of solutions that would have been offered in previous situations. And if the COVID crisis has taught us anything, is that we need a new suite of opportunities. We need new solutions to new problems and knee-jerk reactions have not shown to be very helpful and indeed in other sectors are never shown to be very helpful. And I suppose that's what prompts me to put up the next two bullet points on this slide, which perhaps seems out of order in, the se in, in a sense. The first point is, what is the second thing to do in a crisis? And the first one is, what is the first, sorry, we start off by saying, what's the second thing to do in a crisis? And then I ask the question, what's the first thing to do in a crisis? Any comments on that from the floor? If you consider the response of your own organization, you as an individual in recent months, what are the two things that you have done immediately as part of your 
crisis response. Thanks, Dermot. We have a question from Martin, which we'll come back to in the Q&A. OK. Would people, like to, would people like to post in the chat their responses? So the first thing... Uh, what's the first thing experience. you're doing in crisis and what's the second? Yeah, be very interested to see that. Yeah. You might take a moment if people want to post yep. there. <clears throat> yep. It doesn't need to be a very long answer. One word would do or two words, no problem. Guys, it's Kieran again. I'll throw my two cents in for what it's worth. Go for it. The, the first thing in our experience has been close what's open. So get deals closed that are open before you know the wheels come off the cart effectively. And the second thing is then sit and observe and just watch and take, take, uh, take stock of what's happening before you make any further decisions or commitments then. The, the realignment of the industry costs are changing. So that was probably the, the first two things was close, close what was open and second, observe and watch and monitor and, and try and recalibrate for the new reality we were facing, I suppose. Very good, uh, Kieran. That that's excellent. I, I really love the close uh, what is open yeah. uh, acronym. I think that's that's very very powerful. I, I think Alan at APTN has said also keep in regular contact with the base, which is obviously important as well. Yeah. Any any further uh, comments or thoughts there before we move along? Uh, hi guys, it's Paul Murray from Lufthansa here. Hi, Paul. Thanks for participating. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for holding the session. Um, I mean, Lufthansa is uh, a large mainline carrier with uh, behavior characteristics going back into its being a national carrier. The uh, immediate response uh, that I see is to bring out the worst aspects of working for a large traditional organization, which is that the controllers seized control and that um, the, uh, okay, as Kieran said, uh, invoice what you haven't invoiced, um, hustle everybody to pay their bills as quickly as possible, uh, come up with some kind of long-term idea about generally cutting costs across the board, and while not knowing what the outcome will be, anticipating something around the order of a 30% cut in demand for MRO and to reshape accordingly. <clears throat> um, the difficulty I see there is that it's a kind of a one size fits all approach. And um, um, there's very little finesse to the thinking. So it is a kind of a crisis reaction. Uh, there's very little creativity or imagination in the approach that, that I see. So, Paul, just going back to that previous uh, point from Oliver Wyman about a 50% fall in MRO activity, that isn't quite what you've seen, right? Well, I haven't heard as drastic a uh, pronouncement as that uh, in, inside Lufthansa. They're looking at more of a 30%... Um, a 30% drop, let's say, over the next five years. But I'm not sure the Lufthansa calculations are considering the impact on airline business models in terms of, like my question on business travel, which is going to hit airlines like Lufthansa very badly, or the, uh, the lease life of aircraft and, and the business models surrounding aircraft funding, which moving from 25 to 20 years is going to impact uh, lessors, I suspect, aircraft owners, are indeed the fact that with so many retired airplanes, the inventory values of components held by airlines uh, uh, across the world, uh, the, 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 the balance sheet value of those is, is, is probably going to take a huge hit. So there's various things that would lead me to go beyond Lufthansa's slightly optimistic projection, I would think. Sure. No, thank you for sharing, Paul. That, that's very, very useful. Anybody else uh, like to share on this issue of what are the first couple of things to do in a crisis? I mean, I, I suppose from, from my point of view, um, 
the reason I put this up there is, is very simple. Uh, I, I joked earlier that I did spend some time in the banking industry. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got in that time from a very wise conservative uh, banker was that the first thing to do in a crisis is actually nothing. Nothing. You need to sit. You need to think both individually, collectively at a corporate level, and make sure that in taking some kind of what otherwise might look like a knee-jerk reaction, you don't make a bad situation worse. So in, in very simple terms, the piece of advice that I took away from that discussion is that the first thing to do in a crisis is nothing, and the second thing to do in a crisis is something, whatever that something might be. But I think uh, there is a tremendous amount of utility in just holding back on whatever that first instinct might be. And I think it's particularly prevalent now where we live in this incredible social media world where everybody seems to want an instant response to just about everything that isn't, to put it mildly, always the most appropriate way to go. So there is an awful lot of merit personally and corporately in holding fast mm -hmm. and not making that first instinctive decision perhaps even thinking overnight, and you may well come to a better uh, perspective and a much more reasonable one in terms of the way forward. I think, Dermot, that's the perfect segue for the next few slides. Um, so coping with stress, do you, do you want to have a quick chat about this and then we'll move on to a few slides around attitude and resilience and awareness uh, yeah. around leadership? Uh, I just put a couple of uh, coping mechanisms in here again from that uh, book by, by Newman on uh, emotional capitalists, the new leaders, which I think are, are worth sharing. He talks about the notion that optimism and resilience in the face of adversity is the greatest long term predictor of success for individuals and organizations. And I think there's considerable merit in that. You've got to give people a reason to be optimistic. This second point, I think, is even more important. Nobody can make you feel mad, bad, or even sad without your permission. That, again, is a very important point, because it seems to me that sometimes we regard ourselves as being in rather a passive mode. In other words, we are the, uh, we take on board how we feel about situations from the external environment around us. This suggests that you need to put a block in front of that and you need to be a little bit more careful in avoiding external factors and how they may impact on your thinking and always reserve that personal space and time to make your own decision and to make your own emotional response when, it's, when you're called on to do so. <laughs> the next point really is, is this notion, I think we all know it, I mean, uh, stress can be a positive thing in a work environment. Stress makes us proactive, it makes us do things that perhaps otherwise we might be inclined to sit in our hands and avoid. But clearly a positive mental attitude is a very important constituent part of that uh, solution. The next point is very uh, encouraging too. What is the worst case scenario here, or indeed in any situation that you might face? If everything that could go wrong did go wrong, could I live with the consequences? Well, actually, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong, and we are living with the consequences, and we're still here. And that in itself, I think, is a tremendous source of encouragement as we end 2020 and head into 2021. And finally, as, um, as Simon referred to, uh, all of the participants on today's call are leaders, either today or the future. And our job as leaders is to fight the gravitational pull of negative, negative, negativism, as quoted by Jack Watch. Exactly. And so on, on that point, the, the world's number one leadership thinker, Marshall Goldsmith, reflected recently on what, what he sees as some of the key skills for tomorrow's leaders. And tomorrow's leaders are all of you here. We're all currently tomorrow's leaders. Tomorrow's leaders, he says, will have to embrace global thinking, cross-cultural diversity, 
understand rapidly changing technology, rely more on collaborations and be facilitators, given that we're more in a remote working world, at least for the time being, rather than be experts, which is an interesting perspective. Um, this is just something just to flag, um, you know, from, from, from a business perspective, businesses, including the aviation industry, need to be very mindful that it's not just revenue they're chasing, um, but, but to manage the balance, the three-legged stool of risk, revenue, reputation. And, you know, Boeing would be a good example, perhaps, of a company that, that was focusing maybe more on the apex of the triangle than the other two uh, at, at a certain point a couple of years ago. And then something just to flag from the World Economic Forum. Um, they've just released the top 10 skills um, that, that we all really need from a global perspective going forward. And as you can see, problem solving, self-management, working with people, technology use and development. And I think for the first time ever, they've used the word resilience um, and stress management, which is, I think, no coincidence given that the year we've come through. Um, and, and just something that to build on what um, Dermot said, you know, the, the best leaders realize, and this year is a great example, that, that, we, that you never operate in a vacuum of perfect data. You know, the best leadership is uh, based through exp expedience rather than perfection. Um, there's no such thing as, as, as perfect critical data and nobody knows the future. So I think, uh, you know, resilience, self-awareness and a little bit of groundedness is, is very important. As is, as Dermot has said, the need for a positive focus. We are what we think and who we associate with. And, you know, if we're resting our mind for a period of 60 plus days on negativity, we're going to feel and act and sound negative, um, all common sense stuff. But I think, I think when the books are written about this year in ten years' time, it's been a circuit breaker of a year, the first time in history that all seven and a half billion people have been impacted, and nobody will forget 2020. And and yet, it's quite remarkable how resilient humankind has been, and and the aviation sector is a totem. Uh, for you know the growth and the resilience of the, the, the you know the human race, it's quite remarkable. In terms of leadership growth mindset that we all need going forward, you know, uh, you know, we're, we, no, very few of us have had have not been negatively impacted by this year. And having an awareness of our emotions and our limitations and our triggers, and this really you know applies equally to the to, to the leaders of, of the big aviation companies and and taking time out and uh, realizing that you know um, this too shall pass and most things pass uh, learning to see life and business as it is and not how you wish it to be i think will a preserve sanity reduce stress levels and hopefully allow for some reasonable rational decision making um, just mindful of the time in the last five minutes, I, I recently um, presented at a, a global summit on next business and for the future. And I came up with the, with the, with the tagline, we went to bed in 2019 and woke up in 2030. And, you know, the question mark, a challenge, I guess, for the aviation sector is to what extent is flexible and remote working going to eat in to the sector? Will it be a new norm? To what extent will it remain? There's all sorts of studies saying that you know, 50% will never go back, maybe 30% will never go back, who knows, but obviously these are challenges, uh, and, and as I said before, before, we can only worry about what's within our control. Um, the whole area of remote working, Dermot, I might just quickly go through this, you know, we, we, there's, yeah. been, there's been all sorts of concerns about, work, concerns about, you know, employees not pulling their weight, and, you know, and absenteeism, etc. To the contrary, uh, Wharton Business School commissioned by Microsoft. And I've also seen other studies, particularly in Ireland as well, that have demonstrated that not only have people been working longer hours, but, but there's some sort of demonstration of increased productivity. So um, just something to be mindful of our own health in this, in this situation. Uh, I think that you know, the work isn't going to go away just because the planes aren't necessarily flying right now. Um, a minus, obviously, is, you know, 95% of all innovation from humankind through history has come through face-to-face, -face, physical face-to-face -face interaction. And, and I don't think that one year on Zoom is going to change, you know, that, that habit and, and the rationale of, of human interaction. So um, technology isn't going to completely replace the way we communicate and the way we innovate. But, but I think I think when the books are written in 10 years' time, this will be seen as a circuit breaker year. Um, 
some of the big challenges, obviously, around, um, as I said, the innovation, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges about remote working and how we can, a cultural cohesion uh, in a remote environment and uh, cultural assimilation. We, we all need to be trained to work remotely. This is not a, hum, a, a natural human thing. You know, we are, we are pack animals, for work, want of a better expression. And um, so we do need to find ways to, you know, one year is, is, is a long time. But, you know, if there's, if there's another couple of years of, of this before vaccines are fully rolled out globally or a year of this, we do need to find ways to, to, to A, to mind ourselves and to form regular routines for connecting. That's critically important. We, we, I talk about resilient leadership provides a bridge to the future. And what I mean by this is that all leaders need to be thinking in terms of three things at, at this time. And, and they're all kind of mutually pushing against each other. On the one hand, managing cost and efficiencies, while also continuing to put communication campaigns out there, uh, positive communication campaigns without being negative. If you are, as a leader, are being overly optimistic, then the natural human tendency is to, is to fill a void with anxiety. So you need to have um, honest, as honest as you corporately can be communication without, as Michael Dell used to say, perfuming the pig. You need to be realistic about some of the challenges. And then thirdly, you, you need to be planning forward five, five years down the line. And that is always very, very difficult um, to, to manage that three-legged stool. I see Dermot, you're you're smiling about Michael's comment. <laughs> I hadn't um, heard that one before, but I've heard, <laughs> I've heard I've heard a comment about putting lipstick on a pig, but that, I heard that was another one. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was another one. So and so nobody knows, nobody, there is no secret algorithm for this stuff. But you know, just bear in mind that three-legged stool of managing efficiencies today, communications and and looking forward to the future and how you manage that three-legged stool really is is up to you but you don't want it falling over um so i think i think Claude, we're finishing just on time i think just one minute over but i, I think the message coming from this is from my perspective and then i'll hand it to you dermot is that the aviation industry has been remarkably resilient overall um and you know i was expecting back in march to hear all sorts of negative news this year now maybe some of it's coming next year but but i think it's demonstrated r remarkable resilience and uh, i think humankind generally has and uh, and but i think i think there is change coming and um, dermot would you add, how would you add to that look i, th I think you've said it all i, I think what we've uh, tried to do and, and bear in mind we're not in any way just cheerleading for the sector for the sake of it today but I think when you look at the data, when you look at what we've come through, when you look at some of the initiatives that are, are underway, even in recent days, I think as we look forward to 2021 now, we can do so with quite a bit more optimism than, than certainly would have been the case even four weeks or, or two months ago. So I think on that positive note, uh, one of my favorite uh, lines from one of my favorite movies is hope is a good thing maybe the best of things and good things never die. That came from the Shawshank Redemption. And I think that's a very good analogy as to where we are right now. Yeah, absolutely. Dermot, I, I, I saw earlier on that Martin raised a question. I'm, I'm, I'm just jumping here, here, here Claude, yeah, around in, in, in addition to hydrogen, what do you see is a possibility around alternative, other alternative fuels being taken up in, in, in the industry? biofuels and other type of energy sources? Well, uh, that's a very good question. And actually that uh, Clean Sky report said very little about biofuels. I think there's some concern about the extent to which we could grow enough or develop enough biofuels to actually fuel the industry of the future and, and do so in a way that doesn't interfere with the food ecosystem. So. I think if you take a look, Martin, at that Clean Sky report, uh, certainly in my view of it, they didn't seem to have a very positive impression as to where we might go on biofuels. And they were relying very heavily indeed on what this hydrogen, hydrogen initiative might, might, uh, might uh, result in. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um... Availability of biofuels seems to be a major issue. 
um, especially since everybody else is going to want it, trucks and trains, etc. Exactly. Yeah. It's a very instructive report, uh, the Clean Sky report. And, and if anything, uh, I, I think it is very realistic in terms of pointing out the significant challenges uh, that lie ahead. I mean, I suppose the, the good news, and Paul referred to this, I mean, there's a number of competing factors here uh, that will be of concern about the longevity of existing aircraft types. But I suppose, you know, whether you regard it as good news or not, but the reality seems to be that the existing aircraft types that we've got now are some variant thereof with, you know, improved fuel efficiency and what have you is what's very likely to be with us for quite a significant period into the future. That's my sense reading that uh, Clean Sky report. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Dermot. Thanks, Simon. Um, uh, and I'm very conscious of time. So thank you for the presentation and the insights that were shared here today. Um, would anybody like to unmute and ask a question of Dermot and Simon while we have them here? Thanks, Martin, for that question. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, Alan Phelan here. Um, just, just a comment on, on, on Simon's comment about remote working. Uh, just from my own experience, I'm, I'm sitting here in a nun's bedroom in a convent in Mount Rat, which was a derelict two years ago. It's now been converted into a remote working hub. And it just shows you what can happen in a crisis, you know, in terms of innovation. And I'm here in this environment, connecting with aviation professionals around the world, uh, talking to them on a re regular basis. So I think uh, if you, and uh, the other point I'd like to make is that if you look around where you are at the moment in the current crisis, the amount of innovation and skills that are around you, uh, you know, you mightn't have seen this 12 months ago in your former location, you know, in your little bubble, aviation bubble, but now we've discovered a new world, you know, new industries that are working around us. And, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to try and find new ideas and, and uh, ways forward in this crisis. So that's just my comment on, on the remote working aspect of the crisis. Absolutely, Alan. And it's interesting, you talk, we, we mentioned innovation, and I can't remember the name of the book, but, but there, there, there's a book recently come out. And if you can visualize a triangle, so this was a study on, on, on all the booms in history, going right back to the tulip, uh, the Dutch tulip boom of the 1600s. And if you can visualize a triangle, there seems to be a triangle that generates boom periods without exception. And one side of the triangle is the ease of buying and selling stock and property. And we're in that triangle right now. The second triangle is historically low interest rates. So two of the three are satisfied right now. I'm not predicting a boom immediately, by the way. And the third side of the triangle then is a spark, an innovation spark. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice to think that what's coming out of the rapid, you know, the whole area of genome sequencing and bio data, you know, collaboration and these vaccines, that the conditions seem to be right for a boom. And now uh, whether that's going to be next year or in three years or five years, but I think we'll look back on this period